All right. Uh, welcome to the Web APIs with R Book Club. Today we are looking at Chapter Ten: Find APIs. Uh, the learning objectives are to search the web for APIs, uh, to search for API wrapping packages, and to use browser developer tools to find undocumented APIs. And the general idea is we're trying to figure out or find ways to uh, find, you know, if you're on a web page and it's got some information that you find interesting and you want to find out how to get that information, hopefully we'll be able to figure out how to do that. Um, all right, so first we're going to search the web for APIs. Um, we've seen before APIs.guru. Uh, I've shown that a few times in the past. It's just, it's a site where you can search for keywords and it'll tell you um, if it has anything. So like all these Amazon APIs come up, you search for Amazon and maybe, you know, um, you can see if anything, that's not going to get it, but like, um, that's not working out, but anyway, so you can, you know, you can search through, see things. And the stipulation on this is these are only ones that have a, um, open API specification, which is really nice, but there are some that just don't have an open API specification. And in that case, they are not on, uh, APIs.guru and also APIs.guru, like it was down for a while earlier this year, um, like just the registration on the URL, I think, ran out for a little bit. And so like, um, it's just not super well-maintained, uh, which is unfortunate because I really like the service that it has of collecting all of the specifications. So an alternative that I've been watching is public APIs. Uh, it's at publicapis.dev. Um, the website itself is a little busy and weird and annoying. Um, but uh, he has a um, GitHub repo that is very active. Um, he has a bot, some bots that like check the APIs to make sure they still exist. He has different things like that going on to where um, he keeps it updated, but it does not have the uh, open API specifications. And so it's just like a list of links um, with, little, with screenshots and it's got a little bit of information about it. Um, it's kind of funny because yeah, it's nice. We can search for different things, like what kind of auth does it use? So that is really handy if I'm trying to find examples, for example. Um, cores, we haven't really gone into, but that's whether you can like use it across different websites um, or if the browser is going to reject it. Um, and if it's secure, which should be yes for pretty much everything. Um, but actually on the um, GitHub version, everything is kind of easier to deal with, like he's got tables. And so I plan to set up the same way that I have things that uh, use the APIs.guru and brings that data into R. I'm just gonna bring this data straight into R for us. Um, I don't have that set up yet, but that's my plan because this is really nice, but he has nothing with open API yet. He does have, um, I don't think I have a link to this, but there's an issue about somewhere in here, um, pretty early. Uh, yeah, there we go, to add the open API spec. He's like, well, I like that idea, but he hasn't acted on that. So hopefully by the time I actually publish this book, uh, that will be there and this will be the resource that I recommend. <clears throat> um, the next thing is just search. So if you Google like, um, oops, if I go back here, uh, this is just a Google or, or a search for NY Times API and that will get you the API right at the top. A lot of times if you just use like the core of the website, um, like maybe don't do nytimes.com because sometimes they put their API under like nytimes.dev or something, but you can do the an abbreviation for the website or the full name or whatever in the word API. A lot of times that'll work, um, but not always. Uh, and so something that I have had success with if, like maybe the um, search is just getting way too many pages, just throwing developer or developers onto the front of the URL can find you a lot of things. So like, um, I think, yeah, this is in that case, it was New York Times is at developer.newyorktimes.com. Uh, Google has developers.google.com. 
And so a lot of times that will work to find where to go. Um, usually what those are, are they are like sites that are telling you about what they have for developers. So it's actually even better than finding the API a lot of times. Um, and then also uh, in addition to developer or developers, sometimes, oh, it's not listed here, but a, uh, API or APIs also works, but usually that's gonna be the actual website. So if you go to, you know, like uh, API, or sorry, not the actual website, it's gonna be the actual API. So if you go to api.nytimes.com, it's like, okay, um, this is probably their actual API URL. So that's a good clue that it works, but it's not gonna get you the information you're looking for to actually access it. Um, but it is a way to kind of poke around and find things. Um, oh, back on the uh, Google thing, something to, to note is actually if, when you do a Google search like this, oh, that's also up there. If you look at this, that's a search with a question mark and then Q equals NY times plus API. That's totally just an API. That is a get request uh, with a Q parameter in the query. And so you can call that with uh, or with hitter two, um, Technically speaking, if you go to the robots.txt, like we talked about um, a week or two, two ago, um, they tell you uh, for everybody slash search is disallowed. Um, but that's mainly aimed at if you're going to be hitting it just a thousand times. If you're doing it just for a normal search, it's kind of okay, but uh, it doesn't work that well without doing like a live HTML thing. But I just wanted to point out that is a um, an API. Um, and then kind of the last thing to search for is if you just go to uh, GitHub, github.com, um, and either just go straight to github.com slash the name of the organization or search for the organization, a lot of times you'll either find an API or in this case, it's actually like Washington Post has a GitHub presence. They don't actually have an API, but they have a bunch of things, you know, like data about school shootings. That might be what you're looking for from Washington Post. And so you can find things uh, that uh, might be useful. And they have actually quite a lot of uh, repositories. So sometimes this will be enough. It's not really an API, but it might be a data set that you're trying to download. Uh, and so that is another way to, to search. Do you have any questions, comments around this part? All right. Well, I guess one, but I think you already answered that um, <laughs> a few weeks ago, but I just want to make sure that I get this correct. So these are all um, like APIs for different websites, but sometimes it could also be that you can't find the API, find an API, but they do have a package so that you can use the package <laughs> to communicate with the API. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, so they... Um, usually they will have an API that the package is wrapping, but um, I would say like, even if you find an API with all those tools, I would then see if there a package already exists. And if you can't find the API, see if the package already exists. Maybe it won't be as easy to find. Um, a lot of times, like if you know the URL of the URL of the API, searching for the package can be easier because a lot of times they'll mention it. Um, but yes, uh, definitely look for a package uh, in our package. So next up, tips on searching for API wrapping packages. And before we do that, I do want to give a little, a couple of little tips for text filtering in general, um, because that's what we're going to be doing a lot of that in here. Obviously, like R for Data Science has a whole chapter about working with strings. But just two quick things. Um, either if you're working with Stringer, a lot of the functions in Stringer have a an argument about uh, whether you care about case, or you can just say to lower on whatever you're trying to uh, search in. The function to lower takes a string and makes it lowercase. So if you're trying to find API and you don't care if it's all caps or just capital A or all lowercase or whatever, you can say to lower in the name of that field. And then all the words are lowercase. It's easier to search through. And then the other one is when you're doing uh, regex for searching, which we'll see examples of this in a second, slash B is, um, it means a word boundary, and then you have to double escape it because we're going to be typing it into our string. And so slash slash B 
finds a word boundary, which means uh, space, parentheses, new lines, quotation marks, uh, just the end of the line, anything like that counts as a boundary. So you're just trying to say, I don't want to find API in the middle of a word. I want it to be broken off as its own thing. Um, and so slash slash b api slash slash b is very useful um, for any, you know, if you're just looking for the word api or similarly, like if you're looking for, well, Google's not a great example, but, um, you know, Apple or uh, other, you know, other, some other site, it, a lot of times just putting that slash slash b will help break it out from just being a normal word um, or being within a word. So an example of this, um, first up, and I should have done some uh, code highlighting on this. Oh, geez, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong tab. There we go. Um, so I wasn't showing this, but that's the slash slash B that I was talking about. All right. Um, there's this thing that comes with every R installation in the tools package. There is CRAN package DB. That is a list of every package that is on CRAN. Um, and it's a, well, not a list, it's a data frame. Um, I like to make it into a tibble so it's easier to work with as far as printing. And uh, then you can do things like filter for the description. Um, the description is a paragraph or so about the package. So you can look for the word API in that, or you might wanna look in the title. Title is uh, like a sentence case description of the package. You can look in that. Obviously you could also look in the name of the package itself. Uh, you might wanna look at, um, the author or authors at R field, which I don't show here, but that's another field that's in here uh, because they might credit the API owner. So you might see like credit Google or credit New York Times for copyright on the API. So you can use all of those searches to try to find different APIs. This is just a, you know, the first 10 uh, that are in this particular um, database as of the time that the things were built could have changed since then technically. Um, and you will see though that um, like four through six here are about arrow database connectivity driver manager. And if we saw the description, it's because they're talking about the um, way back when we first introduced the concept of APIs. I said that technically we're talking about web APIs because an API is just like an interface, like the arguments to a function are the API of that function. And every once in a while, a package uses that kind of language. That's what's going on here. They're talking about the arrow API, but it's not a web API. Um, so you have to, you know, you'll have to watch out for that. But again, if you're searching specifically for like Google ads, then Google ads API would have gotten this for you. Um, yes. Uh, another thing you can search is there's this site our universe or, or kind of a concept, and it is a website developed by our OpenSci. It's a project for making package discovery uh, easier. That's the goal. And they wanna make it easier to publish your packages, even if it's not something that you wanna necessarily put on CRAN. Um, I link to their blog all about why it exists. Um, they have a web interface at r-universe.dev. Um, and they do have an API it is uh, relatively actively under development, but r-universe.dev slash API slash search is the API we're gonna be looking at. I can just load this up in the browser, get rid of that one. And we can see that they have this JSON result that comes back. And so that looks pretty promising. Um, the documentation is very heavily under development. And so I had to kind of, figure out some of this stuff. Um, hopefully the next time I come through these slides, it'll be much better and ready to go. But uh, we'll look a little bit at how you can use this. So uh, this, you know, you can make a hit or two request just to that URL that I gave. And the query is, um, it's just Q is the word that you're searching for. So if we're searching for the word API, I can do Q equals API. All equals true means that we wanna look in all of the universes. Um, there's a concept of a universe that's in uh, our universe where you can have your own universe of packages, but we wanna look in all of them. And we're gonna leave it at, or set the limit that we're gonna get hundred per page um, because uh, I mean, technically we could request like a thousand per page, 2000 per page, whatever, but to be good 
web citizens that we have learned throughout the course of this, you want to do little chunks in case, partly in case something goes wrong. Um, but we can do an iterative search, just like we, you know, pagination, like we saw a few chapters ago. Uh, we're going to iterate with an offset. And if what I did here is I got one result and saw, oh, they have this skip parameter. What's that about? It's how many results to skip. So when we first call it, we're going to skip zero. And then the next time we call it, we're going to skip 100. And then we're going to skip 200, 300. It's, this will keep doing that with this offset parameter until it runs out. And then again, you know, going back to that previous chapter, resp pages is a function that tells it um, how to find how many pages there are total. And we can do that by seeing in our response, there's a total field. And so this will say something like, um, I think it's 1384, something like that, uh, at least when I looked earlier today. Um, and so we take that total, divide it by 100 and round up. So that's how many responses, how many pages we have total. And so when we run that, um, we can run that through RESP's data, which again, we saw in the pagination chapter. And we give it a function to get that out, which is just take the results, turn it into a data frame and unless wider. And then again, I'm just selecting package and title, but it has all those fields that we can uh, that you can see in the TZ or in the um, CRAN database. Uh, and here we got a totally different list um, because different things are available and they don't actually auth um, alphabetize by default. But so it's another place that we can look for all kinds of different things. We can do some of the search in the query, and then you could also filter once you get this result back of okay. That query is searching through all the fields, but I only care about whether it's in the name of the package or the title or different things like that. Um, and so you can do finer grained searching from there. Um, I showed it in the order of CRAN first. Um, you might be better off searching on our universe because it includes CRAN. So start there and then you can go to the UI of our universe and say, okay, is this thing that I found on CRAN, um, and maybe that'll like guide which version, which um, API you want to down or use, which package. Because like, for example, if you're looking for the NHL API, I know there are at least two or three that deal with that. Uh, but this will give you all these, you know, all these options. So again, it's just, you know, a queue parameter to tell it what do you want to have in the query. This can be multiple words. This can be a vector of um, strings uh, and it'll, uh, actually, you should combine it yourself. So you should you should um, either combine that or, or there's an argument to rec URL query to tell it to um, combine, which I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, multi, I think, is the argument. Uh, so yeah, that's that'll help you get the packages. So I think that answers the question or the you know the thing you said. So all right. Um, I have another one related to this. So let's say there's an API that, that has its own package so that you can use the package to connect to the API. Could you still go like with the tool that you have shown us and connect to the API without the package, even though the package exists? So that yes. you, you know, um, almost definitely. So, uh, you know, you'd have to. You might have to look at the code. Um, most of the time, once the package exists, you probably don't need to do that. Although, nope, I'm going to take that back because I have several times found a package and like uh, you know start working with it, and then realize that they don't implement the full API. They might leave pieces out. Uh, that's why um, Kevin Kent and I developed our own YouTube package because the one that's on Cran, last I looked, only covers like data about your YouTube channel. You can't use it to manage your YouTube channel. And so we wanted to use the rest of the API. Um, so things like that. And it can be useful that way. You know, you might have to dig into the code and see, okay, what are the endpoints? And maybe even in their code, they will reference the guide that they read about how to set up the API. And then you, you know, that's great. Cause then you can go from there and you know how to do everything that hopefully at this point. And so, um, it's like, if it's a well-built package and it covers all the things you need, usually it's easier to use the package. Um, but if it doesn't, you know, hopefully I've gotten you to the point where you can take it from there.
Um, all right. And then, so the last case that I want to go over with this chapter is when it doesn't tell you, um, like you can't find actual information about the API. And so I want to show uh, browser developer tools. So this differs browser to browser. I'm going to be showing it in Chrome. Um, Microsoft Edge is also a Chromium based browser. So it should be the same there, but I haven't used that in a little while. Um, but this is a way that you can go through and find uh, different APIs, um, you know, like that are on a web page, but uh, maybe you didn't, or that are not documented. That's the wording I'm looking for. Um, I'm actually going to share, I want to do a, um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then reshare with a, uh, a non, or a uh, incognito window, just so that it's raw. Um, I want to show how to find the Amazon API, for example, and I don't want all of my own stuff. To, I don't know what would show up, but I just don't want to put that onto YouTube. So we're going to look at an incognito window. Um, so uh, I, I have some notes for myself. We'll look at the slide when I'm done. But the idea is there's this thing, uh, the um, inspector is what it's under. So if you go to right click inspect or it's control shift I or command shift I, I think we've done this before to look, yeah, we did this to look at the classes and stuff like that for our vest. There's this other tab network. Um, so uh, clear this out. Um, when uh, on this network tab, this is information about like what happens when you load the page. And something really useful here is there's this filter fetch slash XHR. Um, fetch, fetch and XHR are two, uh, formally they're called JavaScript APIs, but they're like JavaScript um, functions uh, for making requests to uh, other websites. Uh, XHR stands for XML HTTP request. It's not just used for XML, it's just that it uh, got named at the time when XML was the main way that people sent data around. Uh, fetch is the more modern version, but both of them are used a lot. And this is if the website uses JavaScript to call an API, this will filter for that type of traffic. And importantly, that's how web pages often make API requests on your behalf. So if you go to Amazon and it makes an API request, it does so for the most part through Fetch and XHR. Um, and so, you know, right now we don't see anything, but if I reload this page, um, we can see all of these things, this kind of a mess of all the API requests that Amazon is making uh, when we load the page. Um, in the case of Amazon, I don't actually, like I'm gonna, you know, we could go through and like look through the path. Oh, sorry, that is something I wanted to show is by default, I don't think um, header options, I don't think path is turned on by default. I highly recommend having it because that's gonna help you understand what you're looking at. Um, but yeah, these are like all of the things that this page has loaded, has called so many things on a modern web page like Amazon. Um, and you know, if you wanna look at what happens when I click something, you can click this circle with a line through it, that'll clear everything out. Um, and actually let me get some stuff back up so I can see what's happening. Okay, um, sorry, I'm gonna clear out one more time. As I mouse over some things, things will show up. Oh, well, uh, but I wanted to look specifically at the um, uh, drop down here. So if I do web APIs with R, um, unfortunately, you know, my book's not there yet because it doesn't exist, but you could see all these different calls came as we were doing it. Uh, there was at least one that was to um, something else, but most of them are to this suggestions endpoint. And so we could just say, okay, suggestions. I want to look at just those. And if we look at the last one that it made, the last call, um, we can see, uh, let me close things up. It has all this information about that call. So I can see the headers. Um, it's, you know, it tells me where the request was made, what the request method was. Um, I could look at um, uh, some things with response headers. Uh, actually response headers are less interesting than request headers where it tells me like, this is the cookie. This is what was in the cookie that was sent. Um, these are all the other fields that were sent 
in the head of um, of the request, uh, we can see the payload. So this is what the query parameters were. Uh, so it has a limit of 11 and it had this prefix field of web APIs with R. And if we go back, you can actually see it's like one character at a time is what's in the, that prefix field. So each time I typed something, it sent another request. You can kind of see how that works. Um, it's got a bunch of other fields as well. Uh, and then we also can see the actual response. And so we can see, yeah, okay, this is what we were looking at because it had um, this RESTful Web APIs is the first selection and that's what's in this value field. Um, and I think I can collapse that. Oh wait, I wanna go to suggestions and then I want the second one. And so you can see the value WebRIC APIs and blah, 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 or WebRTC, that's the second search. So, okay, the second result. So we can see that th that is working. So let's say that we wanted for something we were working with to see what would the request be. All of this information here is the call. Um, and importantly, we go to copy. There's this copy as curl um, bash is the one we want. That's the one that works the best. Uh, and if I go back over to my browser, um, I'm just gonna paste it with raw first. Uh, that is like the full curl call, including the URL, all the things um, for that request. Uh, and we could uh, curl translate this from, if you're, well, we didn't really go over it in this uh, timeline, but there's curl translate. What are you doing? I can't see. I just see oh. one. Oh, because I, that's right. I stopped sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't need that browser anymore. So I will go back and share the things that I wanted to have both of. So that and that. Okay. Okay. So now you can see the browser. Um, so now I can see your R studio. Yes. Or sorry, the R studio. Um, and I don't, is it that, right? There's, um, I'm trying to remember, there's the literal, uh, Web literal that they added a couple of versions of R again uh, ago, and I can never remember how it works exactly, but hopefully it's this. So this will let me put this in without having to do all the escaping, except I don't think that's right. Um, I meant to search for this again earlier today. Uh, uh, or string literal. Um, because, so what we want to do is uh, search for this, uh, da, 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 da. damn it. Uh, or raw strings. That's that's the thing that I was looking for. So R, just R, ah, I had the order wrong. It's R uh, quote parentheses, and then at the end we need to do uh, parentheses quote. Okay. What that says is everything that's inside of there counts as the string, and then I do name the parentheses. Oh, and I need to get rid of the extra thing there. Okay. We curl translate this. Um, it made the hitter two request for the whole thing. Um, so I can copy this and go back up here uh, and actually let's do a new window library hitter two. Put that in and I think actually, let's see. Um, so it got something. Let me add a um, rec body JSON. Um, or resp, not rec, resp body JSON. And hey, we actually did get uh, some su suggestions back. And so um, it's hard to see what's exactly here. I should probably assign that to something. Um, but it works. And so then you can take this, start like deleting things out. Like maybe it doesn't need any of this. And so we can see, is it still, yeah, it seems to still have gotten a result when I do that. Uh, maybe I don't need, well, I'll leave the limit, but maybe I don't need all these other uh, factors. And so I can just say, I'm looking for web APIs with R. Oh, and that, that failed. And so you can start doing that to kind of see piece by piece what you need. Um, in order to make the requests. And um, that can be, you know, really useful as a way to uh, kind of find information um, 
about a request. All right, and let me get my windows rearranged again. Um, and it's useful enough, and actually let me go back to this window and see if I forgot any of the steps that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so we, yeah, filter for that. Um, and yeah, look at the Amazon suggestions. Um, yeah, and so we had all that information about uh, everything in there, not just the request, but also we had the response and we had some information about timing, all kinds of different things. And so as I was playing with this, uh, which happened to be right after we had done the RVEST uh, chapter that has the live HTML thing where you can like interact with the web page and capture it, um, I decided to make a package for this. It's very, 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 very new. Uh, it's called API Sniffer. Um, the goal is to allow you to load the page, uh, possibly do some sort of interaction like we needed to do for the Amazon one there. And then ideally at the end, it, you'll get back a tibble of actually probably multiple tibbles of all the API info. Um, and maybe they are well-structured that maybe we could even make some functions like looking at the functions that are in or the calls that are on the page just automatically make some things to call it. Um, so far, not quite entirely there. And oh, that's the end of the slides, but I did want to show real quick. Um, let's load this package. And I've got, so this is this website here. Actually, we can load it up in the browser just so you can see what it's doing. It was on an example page about um, uh, API sniffing because they do hit their own API to get you all the information about um, pricing, which is actually kind of funny. Uh, because I don't know why it's loading in pounds. I thought it did some stuff to figure out where I was, but um, maybe I'm blocking that. I don't know. Um, but it does lots of calls uh, to different APIs while it's loading. And so if we go back to this. Um, we can do this sniff. It's going to take, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. It loads the page in the background, and then it waits for all the API calls to resolve. And then it returned this, um, right now it's just raw data, but we can um, turn it into a tibble. And I'll go ahead and do that. And it's not gonna be very interesting because it's just this named list of data. But if we uh, on this wider, and I can make my window a little bigger, you can see all these different table or columns it got. And then I'm just gonna use uh, the janitor package has remove empty to get rid of all the NA columns. And we can see that like it found all these queries. Um, you can kind of start to see where this is getting useful because we've got all these ones that are at, at like slash API, you know, account.proton.me slash API slash feature or slash VPN, a couple of different calls to slash payments. Um, and so depending on what API you're, or what web page you're looking at, you might start to see uh, some common calls and even some like common parameters that go into the calls. And so my goal here is to make something where we could um, fairly automatically find the patterns. And then you can use that to, uh, you know, find what you want <laughs> when that within that page. So what APIs are available, it does, it grabs the query. And so you can start pulling out the parameters and, oh, what if I change this parameter to something else? The Amazon one's a much better demo for this, but unfortunately the Amazon one does not work yet in API Sniffer because you need to be able to click things. And I don't have that step yet, um, but coming soon, you will be able to click things uh, and play around and get back this info. Um, it also has a whole bunch of other info about uh, all the responses that came back. So um, there, the responses are by a just like timestamp um, and it's going to give, uh, is it result? Yeah. Um, like all this info that is coming back. So let's just do that. Um, and so right now it's just sending it back raw and doing some stuff to clean it up and have it usable. Uh, but yeah, that's all there. And it's, it's kind of a neat way to dig into a website. If again, if the website has the information you need, but you can't figure out how to get it, uh, this is ho hopefully going to help you do that. So, uh, very much work in progress. And hopefully the next time I take someone through this chapter, uh, it will actually be a little bit more functional than that. All right, I am gonna see um, 
you know, that's the end of this chapter. I'm going to see if we can uh, get uh, a little bit of the way through the next chapter. So the next chapter is it's kind of three sections. And so if we do one of the sections today and then we'll do the other two next week, uh, that might work or something like that. And so let me again, get things set up. Um, no, I need to close some windows. Okay. All right, so I need my author notes. So, all right. Um, again, I know the end of, ending of chapter 10 was a little bit uh, just chaotic, but that's because that's where I am with it right now. Uh, but hopefully that will allow you to do some, you know, any any searching you need to do. All right, and so then this last chapter, which again, technically we might get through in 20 minutes, we'll see. Um, it is about other ways of working with APIs. So everything we've done so far has been uh, HTTP APIs and specifically REST APIs. That's the name of this style of APIs where we have the get and put and post and delete verbs and you know everything that we've talked about kind of the format of the requests, the, the things that um, Hitter2 is built to deal with. Uh, but there are three other major like frameworks that, um, well, I mean, there are more than three, but there are three that are used enough and kind of make enough sense in R that I thought they were worth talking about. So we're, we want to look at, um, just kind of do a quick look at fetching data from GraphQL APIs. You might talk, see people talk about their Graph API or their GraphQL API. So that's what that's about. Um, I will say, as I worked on this, I kind of think I'm probably going to make a chapter out of the GraphQL one because uh, it is made for data and should be better in R than it is. It's a little bit rough right now in the R landscape, but um, I want to help make that better. <laughs> and so probably going to expand that into a chapter. Then the other two are fetching data from WebSocket APIs or working with WebSockets and fetching data from gRPC APIs or Google Remote Procedure Calls. Uh, there are lots of different packages that we might look at um, as we're working with this, but uh, these are all, you know, there are three like independent things. Uh, I want you to have something you can go to if you are reading API documentation and they say, oh yeah, we have our REST API, but our, really all of our efforts now are in our Graph API. You go, oh, I know what to do with that. I will go look at that chapter again. Um, all right. So first, GraphQL, what is it? Um, it is an open source data query and manipulation language, which again, sounds like it should just be really up every R user's alley, but it's, we'll see a little bit about that. Um, it has two main um, like things that you can do with it. You can make a query, which is data you need, or you can make a mutation, which is either new data to add or data you want to change. You can already see it's kind of speaking our language. Uh, you know, it's talking about mutations. So, oh, it's like it's mutating. Okay, I get that. Um, it uses a JSON-like format, but it's not in exactly JSON. And a GraphQL and, uh, API is a little bit weird because it has one endpoint. You are just hitting the API and what makes it do its thing is based on the data that you send it. So you can send it data with like holes in it and that'll say, hey, I want you to give me this info or you can send data uh, that is like new and it tell it to create the, uh, the object. Right now, everything we're gonna look at is about fetching data um, because there's a little bit of coverage of fetching data in R, not much really at all for creation. And honestly, most of the time, that's what we would be doing is trying to fetch data from one of these. Um, it was developed by Facebook, uh, open sourced pretty early in its life cycle. Um, and it's, again, intended to take to allow you to take the, face, or the, the data you have and get the data you need. And so it's right up our alley for uh, the kind of thing we want. Um, it's used by Facebook, GitHub, Yelp, Shopify, um, a lot of just random, like we're going to look at this country uh, database uh, in a minute that, that uses GraphQL. It's just a lot of things where you want to be able to fetch a lot of data. Um, the current landscape of packages for GraphQL to me feels like, well, I use GraphQL in other languages and I want to technically be able to do so in R. 
but it's not like I think they don't feel like are in a lot of ways. Um, they're written kind of for people who already know how to do this stuff. It's not that feel of it's just natural language that you're typing like you get with uh, the tidyverse. And so, you know, that part's a little bit unfortunate and you have to like build the query as a string. It doesn't let you put in a list. Like I feel like it should, things like that. Um, but there is this GHQL package uh, for client side. We're gonna take a look at that. Um, there's also G GQLR, so graph query uh, language in R. Um, it lets you do the server side where you can like create your own um, GraphQL API. We're not gonna talk about that, but I just wanted to let you know that there are these two and there's actually another one that is wrapped by GHQL that we'll talk a little, a little bit about on the way, I think. Um, I will load up. So GHQL, it is an uh, R OpenSci package um, and it uses, uh, yeah, GraphQL is kind of, is the parser that's inside of it, but we won't ever have to deal with that one directly. All right. And so we're gonna go through an example real quick. Uh, it's this country's GraphQL API. Um, it is from the GQL um, or GHQL rather uh, package examples, um, but I adapted it a little bit. Um, I linked to the GitHub repo because if we go straight to the API, it's just like an interface for working with the API. Um, and it's a lot easier to go through or to read through. He has more explanation of how this thing works on the GitHub. Um, and so to set up, we use this uh, function from JHQL GraphQL client uh, and that upper camel case followed by dollar sign new is a sign that this is using R6, which is a op uh, object oriented system that's within R and all the code, if you're writing code in, in R6, it doesn't look like normal R. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, and you can see advanced R for getting started with it, but I, that's what I don't like about these is they're very weird and it does just doesn't feel like R, but we'll live with it. So to get this started, we have to do this GraphQL client dollar sign new and give it the URL that we're starting or that we're talking to. So that sets up our connection. And then we're gonna create a query, an empty query with this GHQL query dollar sign new that just gets it initialized. And then we can take our query and tell it to make a query inside of itself. And that's where we have to give it this language. So we have to give it the name of our query. So we could name this whatever we want. And then this is the GraphQL formatted um, just text. Uh, notice that it's just all one argument as a, a string, um, as something where I don't, I wish they had let us kind of build this as a list and then it would put it together as an argument, um, but say la vie. Um, and so we're saying, okay, we want to call the query side of this uh, endpoint. Um, and then we define any variables we're going to use. So we're going to use code. So we put dollar sign code and we say that that is a string. Uh, the brackets mean that it's an array and uh, you need a, the exclamation point because it can't be null. That's what all that, what all that means. Again, the documentation on GitHub gives us a little bit of information about that. And then we can say, you know, okay, um, we want to look at the country's endpoint. Because if we look at this thing, um, we can see that there are, uh, there's country, and but then there's also countries that lets us like search. Um, not super easy to see in that uh, UI, but uh, this is just an example. Um, and so we go back to, we have that code variable and we can say, okay, we need, we want to find countries where the code is in that code variable. And then I'll show you how we define that code variable on the next screen. Um, and then we say, okay, I want to get back the code, the name of the country, the capital, the phone, the languages, which will itself be a list. And so you can kind of see how this is, um, you know, everything that's inside of brackets is an object. And then Languages are their own little object, uh, but we're telling it all the information of what we want out of this API. Again, in the API, uh, it's got a whole bunch of different um, 
fields that we can get. There's actually, I think, more than what we're seeing right there. Um, so uh, we can see some of the things to help us learn how to build this up. Um, but all right. Oh, the weird thing you might notice is there are no commas. So it's just like line, new lines for each thing. Um, and so that's different from JSON. And there are no quotation marks. It's just, you're just saying, I want code, not the word code. Um, again, that's just a little difference from JSON. All right, and let's see how that actually works. So then we take, you know, we make our variable that is our codes. And I wanna look at in this place, in this face, yeah, in this case, US and uh, Germany, Deutschland. And we go back to, we had created our GHQ, QL con, that's our connection. And so we're gonna tell that con that we wanna execute a query. And we take that query and inside a query, there is queries and country data, cause that's what we named our query. And then we also have to give it our variable. So country codes. Um, and then, uh, so that's X that I'm saving that as, that actually did the query and we can just look at JSON, it comes back in JSON. So we can go from JSON and voila, we got a table or a table back of countries with the data that we asked for. Again, this, um, it's, it would be very useful if this package were easier to use. I would, I am hopeful that eventually someone will make something that's kind of a wrapper around the package and makes it where you can do things in a little bit more natural uh, you know, say these are the variables I want and it'll figure out the formatting, um, things like that. But uh, not to, you know, sh make people shy away too much because it does work and you can you can poke around eventually and get the data. Um, like I said, I think I'm going to pull this out into a chapter because I think it is useful, but, and it's hard to follow. <laughs> and so I, I was just going to do a little quick intro, but I think it deserves more than a quick intro. So next iteration, hopefully we'll have a little bit of a deeper dive on this. Um, and then much faster for the last couple, uh, WebSocket, um, it's an alternative to HTTP. Like, so this one, that one was still HTTP, yeah, HTTP. It's a normal URL. It starts with HTTP or HTTPS. WebSocket is its own type of URL. It starts with WS or WSS uh, colon slash slash. Um, it's built for two-way communication. There is a package by Posit called WebSocket. Um, that package is used inside of Chromote and uh, there's a package shiny load test that uses WebSocket. Um, and also shiny actually uses WebSockets but it doesn't use the WebSocket package. Just as a quick aside, sometimes you'll see uh, in shiny, um, depending on exactly what you do, you might see an error that says something about like socket disconnected or things like that. That is because shiny is using WebSockets. And again, because Shiny or WebSockets is two-way communication, Shiny can use it for the UI and the server to communicate. So the browser, you know, the user's uh, computer is looking at your Shiny page and it's talking to your server code. And then your server code is talking to the Shiny page. And so they're talking back and forth using WebSockets. Um, they don't use the WebSocket package inside of Shiny, but it's the same idea. Uh, how it works is, way beyond the scope of this book, but I just wanted to mention that it is in there. Um, WebSockets are weird because it is this live two-way connection. So it's good for things like news or messages, like a feed, so that you could display new content as it comes in. Um, it's used a lot for messaging, so you can send and receive at the same time without new connections back and forth. It's used for like multiplayer games, collaborative editing, real-time dashboards. So that's why Shiny uses it. Um, but it's not good for like reproducible analyses because like if you set a variable up with a WebSocket, um, it will, its value can change as you're like typing other things. Like in the background, it's doing this communication until you, until you tell it to close. Uh, so an example, I have played around with using it for like the latest Slack message that comes into the data science learning community Slack make a variable that is just that. And so I could like look at that, interact with that, whatever the last message was. And as I'm working, it, it could change. I haven't ever actually done anything with that, but I like, it's possible to set it up that way. It's really weird. Um, I do, I have a demo. I 
honestly, I don't think it's really worth going through the demo because I want you to know this exists. And if you really care, you can go come look at the demo, but you probably shouldn't ever need to do this in R. Um, but you might, like if you're trying to write a shiny alternative or something like that, you might work with WebSockets. Um, but yeah, the general idea is you set up a thing and then it'll just sit there listening. And as events come in, it'll keep adding them even after you've gone on and done other code. Uh, and so it's really weird in that way. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. And then the last one, and I am going to squeeze this in because we have five minutes. It's really going to be pretty short. Um, GRPC. So GRPC stands for Google Remote Procedure Call. Um, there used to be other forms, and technically, I guess there are other remote procedure call frameworks for APIs. The general idea is that you call a function that is on someone else's computer. And so it's made to feel more like, or the it, it it's working towards that it feels more like just normal programming, that it just happens to be the function is somewhere else. Uh, this gRPC is becoming very popular. You'll see a lot about it if you go searching for APIs, but it's used um, almost exclusively for like internal communication. If you've got um, a bunch of uh, APIs like at a business that talk to one another, divided up into like microservices that are tightly coupled. Uh, a lot of times people will use gRPC for that because again, it's this um, two-way communication and it's really um, like uh, uh, efficient or it aims at being efficient. Uh, it does still use HTTP, but it's the upgraded one, HTTP2, um, which is more socket-like. Technically, you can use uh, Hitter2 to access that, and we will um, possibly see a quick example of that here. Um, and then the, the thing that makes it gRPC is it has this protocol buffers data type where you take whatever data you're working with, turn it into this digital protocol buffers thing, and that's what you send back and forth with this gRPC. But then on the receiving end, they turn that back into whatever they use natively. And so um, I'm going to try to go quickly through, um, there is this R proto buff package that implements all of this, but uh, proto light is everything that you probably would need. Um, and I want to just show, um, I'm actually going to skip this. Well, actually this is kind of neat that, um, you know, we're just doing a hit or two request, but we're going to this thing that is the mass pack, oops, sorry, the mass package, like from R, and the data in the mass package, animals, and then proto buffer, or uh, yeah, proto buff, proto buffer. We perform that and we can take that and then turn it from proto buff into native R format. And then it like gave us the data set, like as a data frame. We didn't do anything to take you know JSON and translate it into a data frame. It like sent the data that means data frame. Um, so you were working natively in R, sending it back and forth, just kind of neat. And so, you know, we got an actual data frame back. There's this website um, or this um, site that has uh, 88 packages of R, including some of the tidyverse, unfortunately not uh, dplyr, but it does have like tibble. So we're going to see a quick example here that, you know, we can say, okay, I want to, I don't have the, the tibble package on my local computer for whatever reason I have. Uh, hitter two, which would be weird to not have Tibble, but whatever. I've got, you know, I don't have some package. I've got that sharded off on a different um, example. Um, and I will come back and uh, answer your question I just saw in the chat. Uh, but so, okay, I want to I want to call the Tibble function from the Tibble package, and I want to send it this list. You know, that is the parameters I'm going to send into it. Um, I can just say serialize PB on those args that turns it into that proto buffer format. And then I can make a hitter two request to this uh, opencpu.org. Um, this this URL is R, like it'll well, it's it's lots of things, but it uh, lets you go into R. And we're saying we want to go to the package tibble, the R directory, and so not the data directory, the function tibble, and then proto buff uh, mode. And we just send it this raw payload, which is the proto buff. Um, and we tell it that it is this protobuf application type and perform. And the response we get back when we unserialize again to go back to R is a tibble. So again, it's not like data that you can turn into a tibble. It actually sent back a tibble, uh, which is 
interesting. Now, I don't have a use case for this yet, but this one feels like I could imagine um, like uh, setting up a bunch of data science learning community services that are speaking R to one another. You don't have to do any translation in between where we go from R to a CSV or to arrow or to whatever else. You just keep it as a tibble and send it over to some other function that deals with whatever the data is going to be dealing with. Um, so this one is, I think, an interesting idea. Uh, and sorry, my doorbell is about to ring, but uh, <laughs> we will be wrapping up anyway. anyway I, I think it's an interesting idea, but I don't have an, a solid example for it yet. Yeah. Um, to go into the yeah. chat that our is it Mentimeter and Poll everywhere examples of all sockets. I'm not familiar with those. Um, a so lot, the, so the idea of those websites is that you let's say you're given a class or something and you want to get feedback, anonymous feedback, oh. usually from the audience, so okay, they do text or um, uh, through your um, writing like a text, or they just go to a website and then they answer I, the question, so you see the results in real, in real life, in real time, yeah. Um, That's, I know. I, um, I'm not sure. So it could be, it kind of should be. And I need to send a quick text to make sure someone is coming closer to the door. Um, but yeah, it, those kinds of things. So what usually happens um, is they are using um, uh, WebSockets under the hood. Uh -huh. And so they won't be WebSockets in the part that you interact with. But somewhere underneath, it might be creating a WebSocket connection. Uh, a lot of real-time chats where you have on a website where it's a chat. I mean, a lot of times that's just not actually real-time and it's just sending uh, different API requests. But sometimes it is going to be doing a real-time WebSocket. Um, it, but it does have that you know weird property of it. Uh, when, they, when something happens, your R session will get it if you're working with WebSockets. And so it doesn't matter what else you're working on, it'll come back in. Technically it's doing like a pull in the background. And so it's looping through, but in between what you're working on, it'll get this uh, result. Mm -hmm. um, All right. I, again, I don't know how much uh, with either of these last two, anyone will work uh, on it. Um, but uh it's good to know they exist. I kept seeing them when I was like um, trying to find some nice information about uh, APIs in R. I would see, well, GraphQL I've seen lots about. I knew like I've worked with some, some, but GraphQL is basically just a normal API that it just has one endpoint, but uh, the format of the request is what's really weird. But the, um, the way you talk to it isn't, it's, like a normal API. These other two, they're they're weird. They don't work like, well, you know, it turns out gRPCs can be mostly like a normal API, but it's meant to be uh, very much, it, it, if you set it up, you can get to the point where it just feels like you're calling a function. It just happens to be that that function is on another computer, but you don't have to do anything to the data um, other than the one, you know, the protolite uh, piece, but you don't have to, you don't lose, like if something's in a date, format. If you put a date format into a CSV, it may or may not come back the way you meant it. Like it might lose time zone information or things like that. But if you send it through a uh, protobuffer, it is still that same field. So it has all that same values. It has the time or the time zone and anything else, any other properties that you need. Um, and so those have a lot of potential, I think, for creating some interesting uh, ways to communicate, but they don't, mm -hmm exist that much um, yet. So it's way more so, more useful if you're creating your own, I think. Um, yeah, and so that is the book. Uh, like wow. I said, there I already know some changes. Like I'm gonna almost certainly expand that GraphQL stuff into its own chapter. Uh, this stuff will still remain as just a little bit on the end because it, definitely doesn't feel like it deserves its own chapter, but the GraphQL, I think I could expand um, and should, I think it's really useful. Um, 
and you know I'll keep the the slack updated as I go through um yeah. Yes, please do, because I feel like now that everything is uh, has its own video, right? Like every chapter, I can go back to all of it. <laughs> but I need to, I mean, that's how I learn. I don't know if it's the right. same one, but I need to hear the same thing over and over again, right? <laughs> the repetition. And I feel like then I see one thing and then I can do something like on my own, even though you, you still don't have any exercises or something. I know you'll have yeah. the book. But then I yeah. can, go, you know, practice on my own and, and, and do things like that. So I feel like that's super, super cool. Yeah, yeah um, exercises are, I, I think that next I am going to focus on exercises mm -hmm. before I do the actual writing, because that way I can see, oh, I don't have a way, like, I don't tell you how to answer this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that should be coming pretty soon. Now, you know, will take a while to go through but uh that is my next focus um and i we'll see i'm not doing it today but i do want to try to set something up uh having this accountability has been really useful mm. uh, oh i got to get this done because I, we have a meeting this week um and so um i want to try to set up some timelines that way so hopefully you'll be seeing uh, quite a lot of exercises coming through and then actual chapters to go with them um most likely what I'll do is write the exercises, make sure the slide decks cover everything to answer those exercises, and then do the actual chapters. Um, because it's easier to edit the slide decks than text. Uh yeah. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and um end.